Industry on Parade, Peabody Award winner for public service, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. A technical and engineering school, its graduates are among the most sought after young men in America. Sought after not just by young ladies, although they do all right there too, but sought after by industry, which is urgently in need of people with the proper background to cope with the complexities of a rapidly advancing scientific age. Months before graduation, recruiters from various branches of industry visit campuses of all kinds of schools, from the small liberal arts college to the technical school like Lehigh, trying to interest the most promising graduates to be to come to work for their companies. Sam Newman here is being interviewed by a representative of the steel industry and he decides that's where his future lies. Three months before graduation, every member of Sam's class knows where he is going to be employed. For Sam, it's right here in town at Bethlehem Steel Company. In fact, while still in school, Sam begins a series of get acquainted tours of the plant, learning how many and varied are the different departments that make up a large organization. There's sales and distribution and purchasing and advertising and all the rest. During the course of an intensive on-the-job training program, Sam will get to know something about the operations of every department before he settles down in the niche that best suits him and the company. The chief function of a manufacturing company, of course, is production. And as an engineer, Sam is most likely to be concerned with that. Although in this technological era, even many salesmen must be graduate engineers, must understand how and why steel is turned out in dozens of different forms and according to hundreds of different formulas to serve its many purposes. Thanks to engineers who have preceded him in the business, the quality of metals can be automatically controlled. But as we proceed into a period of still greater industrial progress, the job of producing metals to withstand unheard of temperatures, stresses, and strains will be up to the men of Sam Newman's generation. The engineer is the man or woman who takes the discoveries of other scientists and determines exactly how they can be put to practical application. For a prosperous peacetime economy, as well as for a strong defense in case of attack, the engineer is essential. The country needs very badly a lot more Sam Newmans. At least 30,000 more every year. Today's management recognizes that human progress must go hand in hand with mechanical and scientific advances. Thus, hundreds of manufacturing companies provide positions for handicapped persons so that they, like all of us, may gain the human dignity and personal satisfaction of being productive and earning a good income. Properly fitted to his job, the handicapped worker usually proves that he is equal and sometimes superior to other workers in work performed, attendance, safe working habits, and attitude toward his job. Industry welcomes physically handicapped workers. One tiny section of the electronics division of a large electrical manufacturing company. Twenty years ago, the firm's electronics division could have been fitted easily into one small corner of this room. Today, the room represents only a fraction of the space devoted to what is perhaps the fastest growing of all industrial sciences. What they're assembling, inspecting and adjusting in this department of General Electric Company's plant in Syracuse is television transmitting equipment. Not receiving sets, that's another much larger operation. These are the devices that send out the television signal from your local TV station. And brother, the engineering that goes into sending out that signal. The equipment for one television transmitter can cost tens of thousands of dollars. It's packed with tubes, many of which cost hundreds of dollars apiece. No wonder then, that they face some serious problems in delivering the equipment to the TV stations.
they found that the safest method of handling such gear is the kind of handling administered by furniture movers. Apparently, a television control console has a lot in common with a Chippendale chest of drawers. And the men who have been transporting Chippendale from coast to coast for many years know all the techniques for avoiding jars, jolts, and scratches. These men happen to be employees of a local moving and storage firm, Lavoie's. But Lavoie's is also part of a nationwide organization of independent trucking companies, North American Van Lines. So, once loaded, the two trailer trucks carrying this shipment will not be unloaded until they back up to the delivery point, wherever that point may be. The drivers stay right with the trucks and handle the unloading at the other end. Once properly packed, the van makes the trip all the way. A few days later, the transmitter is open for business. And some of the viewers watching this program right now are watching it via transmission from the equipment we saw being shipped. It takes a lot of skills to bring television into our homes, and among them are the skills of the moving man. Parked outside a home in Atlanta, a delivery truck with a load of rock wool insulation aboard sends the rock wool directly into the attic of the house, bypassing all the downstairs rooms. Bags of the material are dumped into a hopper from which the rock wool is blown through a long, flexible pipe right up to the attic. Many owners of older homes, not as well insulated as buildings being put up today, are undertaking this modernization job. They do it for two reasons, to cut down on fuel bills and to make the house more comfortable to live in, summer and winter. Let's visit this Atlanta plant and learn how rock wool is made. The raw material is a rocky residue or slag turned out by foundries as a byproduct of their operations. Shipped here to the Munford Company, this slag is mixed with coke and fired in a large furnace or cupola. Here, a wheelbarrow full of slag is dumped into the skip that will carry it into the cupola. In seconds, the heat of the coke, assisted by natural gas flames and a constant blast of air, causes the rock to melt. When it does, it flows out over jets of high-pressure steam, which fluff it up like cotton candy and blow it into what is called the wool room a few feet away. Very fine fibers of rock wool tangle and intertwine, creating millions of tiny air pockets which give the product its excellent insulating qualities. Vibrators now shake out glass pellets formed during the blowing process. Now the product is ready to be bagged and shipped. What was once only a waste product, foundry slag, thus is converted by a few simple but ingenious processes into an item highly useful to just about everyone. In addition to its power of insulation, rock wool, of course, is absolutely fireproof. Place a penny on a handful of the stuff and apply an acetylene torch. The penny will melt and burn, and only the fibers directly around it are affected. They melt, while fibers an inch away remain intact. Men have been building their homes out of rocks for many centuries. But only recently have they used rocks that come all fluffed up in paper bags and are sold at stores in every community. Many people find older homes more comfortable and usually less costly than newer ones. But the comfort vanishes if you have to live in rooms that are chilly all winter and blazing hot all summer. Also, the illusion of low cost can evaporate when sky-high fuel bills pour in. With the help of the missus, here's how one homeowner is solving the problem.
No matter how hot or cold the attic may get, the lower floors will be snug and pleasant, thanks to insulation made of rocks. With America's population growing at the rate of two and a half million persons every year, census experts tell us we'll have a population of 200 to 220 million by 1975. With such an increase, businessmen know they are going to be called upon to create 22 million new jobs between now and 1975, when we can expect a working population totaling 88 million men and women. To create these jobs means billions of dollars must be invested in plant, tools, and equipment to produce everything Americans need or desire. Romping up and down the hills of San Francisco is a moving monument to America's irrepressible love for tradition, the San Francisco cable cars. Some months ago, a move to retire the cars in favor of buses touched off a storm of protest, not only here, but all over the country. To everyone who has ever lived in or visited the city, the cable cars are San Francisco. Taking cognizance of that fact, a local designer and manufacturer of exhibits and displays for conventions, sales rooms, trade shows and the like, made the cable cars his inspiration. This is the sort of thing the firm of William Sanford exhibits turns out. Still or animated showpieces designed to put across a message in the most interesting, attractive and informative way possible. So, when a local dressmaking company, Corret of California, asked for a distinctive rack on which to display its products, the best brains of the organization came up with the idea of a rack that's a miniature of the world-famous cable car. 200 of the little cars have been painted, assembled, and sent off to stores everywhere, there to remind customers that San Francisco is a city whose charm and grace are exceeded by few of the much larger world metropolises, and by association, of course, to convey the same pleasant thoughts about sport clothes made in San Francisco. The cars are not exact scale models of the real thing. They've had to be modified to accommodate dresses rather than nimble-footed daredevil passengers. No seats, instead chrome bars to hold the hangers. Regardless of the modifications though, lovers of tradition will be happy to know that they're still making cable cars in San Francisco.